listening to the Read Aloud Revival Podcast. This is the podcast that inspires you to build your family culture around books. Well, thanks for tuning in today. I'm Sarah McKenzie, your host for today's episode of the Read Aloud Revival. This episode, frankly, surprised me. I was surprised by how interesting my conversation with Dr. Price was. I was kind of hesitant to hang up the phone after our call because it was really compelling information and he is truly just a super smart, very friendly guy. So I know you're going to enjoy this episode. Before we get started, remember you can access the podcast show notes with links to everything we talk about in today's episode at readaloudrevival.com. Just click on episode 33. If you're a member of the Read Aloud Revival, of course, you can also get the complete transcript, the cheat sheet with an action plan and a time-stamped cheater guide, and the printable show notes that you can tuck into your diaper bag or purse for the next time you drop into the library or used bookstore. So you can just grab those great books that we talk about on the show. So just log into membership to access those. Alrighty, are we ready? Here we go. Joseph Price is an associate professor in the Department of Economics at Brigham Young University, who specializes in research related to labor, family, and health economics. His research has been widely published. You might have spotted his name in the New York Times, Washington Post, or heard him speak on NPR, CNN, or the Today Show. He's the Senior Fellow of Economics for the Austin Institute for the Study of Family and Culture, and he's written more than 30 published articles, including several related to marriage and children. His article on parental time investment in children focused heavily on the benefits and importance of reading aloud, and not surprisingly, he's found that reading aloud together makes a huge difference, and so that's what we're going to chat about today. Dr. Price, thank you so much for joining me on the Read Aloud Revival. Yes, yeah, sir. Thanks for having me. Well, would you take just a minute at the beginning here to tell us a little bit more about your family and your work? Sure. Uh, so my wife, Emily, and I, we've been married for 15 years. And we have seven kids ranging from the oldest of 14 and the youngest is one. Okay. I have to inter- interrupt here. I've got six. Oldest is almost 14 and our youngest is two. So, <laughs> oh, so we match up pretty well. Yeah, yeah, pretty well. <laughs> I've worked at BYU for about seven years. And before that, I was a PhD student at Cornell University. Very good. Okay. So one of the things that when I talked to Dr. Pakalik for an earlier episode of the podcast, she had told me, oh my goodness, Sarah, you've got to talk to Dr. Price. And she was talking about an article you published called The Effects of Parental Time Investments, Evidence from Natural Within Family Variations. Do you want, can you tell us a little bit about that paper and maybe tell us why you use parent-child reading as a way of measuring parental time investment? Sure. So this is actually a working paper with Ariel Khalil, and it builds on some earlier work I did about birth order differences and how much time parents spend with their children. And what I found in that earlier paper is that parents spend about 30 extra minutes with their, their firstborn child every day, and this adds up to about 3,000 hours over the childhood. And this birth order gap is larger if the kids are spaced further apart. And so the, the purpose of the second paper was to use this variation between the two children to see if that extra time the first child's getting, particularly in reading and other good activities like talking, contributes to um, higher academic performance. Okay, that's interesting. So you mean 30 minutes more a day, the firstborn child gets 30 minutes more every single day from their parents than the second child? Yeah, though the parent doesn't even realize they're doing it. Because yeah. when I see, because here's what's really happening. On any given day, you have a six-year-old and a three-year-old, and you spend the same amount of time with both of those kids. But now let's jump into the future three years. So now you have a nine-year-old and a six-year-old. Mm-hmm. You give both those kids the same amount of time, but it's actually, as your kids get older, you spend less time with them. Mm-hmm. And so now the six-year-old, your younger child, when he's six, will get less time than the older child got when he was six. I see. Mm-hmm. And this is particularly acute for reading aloud, because unfortunately what happens in a lot of families is with that oldest child, when that oldest child is young, we read to the child a lot. It's a real focus of our attention. But then by child you know, two, three, or in your case, six, (laughs) you know, I'm sure you're actually, you and I probably do a good job at this, but for most parents, that younger child gets pulled into the kinds of things the older child's doing, which unfortunately is more like television driving together. And so the reading time is much less for that youngest child than it is for the oldest child. Oh, I've definitely seen that. Even with my being really intentional, our youngest are twins. So being really intentional to make sure we're sitting down and reading books with the twins every day, 
I still know that I read more to my oldest daughter. I mean, there's just more books that we read back then than because I'm, you know, there's so many more demands on my time and attention. Is there a correlation then? I'm just curious now, <laughs> selfishly here. Is there a correlation? The more children you have, is there any kind of correlation there that's worth noting? Well, this is actually what got me into the whole area is I was having my fourth kid and a professor at Cornell said, hey, don't you know about the quantity quality trade off? And it made me wonder. Only, you know, pro- to, only professors talk this way, you know. <laughs> I know. And they say, well, you know, there's this pie and you have to split the pie out between more kids. And I started thinking about the way I spent time with my kids. And it wasn't really like a pie that I was splitting. It was really a pie that I was sharing in different ways. Because when I read to my kids, I was usually reading to more than one kid. When we ate dinner together, we, we were all, all there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what I found is that actually, you know, when I had four kids, I actually ended up devoting more total time to my kids than when I just had the one kid. And so it made me start to think about, well, how does this pie work? How does the pie get split differently across children? And what is what implications does that have about the effect of family size and birth order? Interesting. Okay, so how did you quantify the benefits of reading aloud or how do we do that? Well, it's really challenging. And let me tell you two common ways to do it. And we can think about why they might not be the best approach. One is if you have some survey data, you could ask a mother, how much time do you read to Johnny? And then you can look at the relationship of that variable with Johnny's test scores. And what you'll find is that's positive, of course. But it might just be that the types of parents who read to their kids are different in other ways. So then it might not just be reading, but it might be the other things those parents are doing. So then the second approach would be to say, ask the mother, how much do you read to Johnny and how much do you read to Tommy? And then compare that to Johnny and Tommy's test scores. Now, the unfortunate thing there is that parents will often read more to the kid who's struggling yeah. in school. Mm-hmm. And so if you run that regression, then what it looks like is that reading to your kids lowers their test scores. <laughs> but all it's telling you is that parents engage in compensatory investments. So those would be the standard approaches, neither of which I think gives you the right answer. Well, the other problem that immediately kind of leaps into mind with that is that what if the goal doesn't have anything to do with the test score? Oh, that, that's certainly true. Like, definitely, I think we accomplish so much by reading to our kids. Unfortunately, like as an economist, we have to look at those outcomes that have policy relevance, like test scores or graduation yeah. or uh, other, other things like that. But I yeah. think as parents, we want to open our kids to a, an entire world of learning and an excitement for books which are hard. Those are hard to measure. Right. So you're, you're totally right. But just, I think a lot of us also care about test scores. And so that's a reasonable thing to look at. And it's easy to quantify. Yeah, exactly. So the two traditional approaches aren't well equipped for this question. So what you'd need then is something, I mean, ideally, what you want is a randomized control trial that you tell mom to, hey, I want you to uh, flip a coin. And then if it's heads, read more to Johnny. If it's tails, read more to Tommy. <laughs> uh, it's like, those are hard to do. And so what you want to look is something in nature that creates something like a coin toss. And so what we use is miscarriages. And miscarriages will push those two kids about an extra year apart in age. And based on my earlier work, I know that when I push two kids further apart in age, it makes the birth order gap in reading time larger. Okay. And so that's the kind of natural experiment that we're trying to exploit. I see. I thought that's really interesting when you said parents, you know, adjust their reading time in response to how their children are doing in school. So is that like a conscious, do you think that's a conscious decision parents make? Or do you think it's kind of unconscious that when your child's struggling in school, you tend to read aloud more to them? Well, it relates. I mean, I think it's both conscious and unconscious. So one thing, for example, most parents stop reading to their kids around the age of eight. Whereas I think that all of us should continue to read to our kids until they're grown up, like until they're 18 or 19, because there's always going to be books that we can read to them that they can't read to themselves. Yeah, but, that's one of the things I loved about Andrew Pudua. I had him on the show very early on. He was the first guest. And I don't know if you're familiar with his work there at the Institute for Excellence in Writing, but he makes a pretty good case for why he thinks it's almost more important to read to your child after the age of eight or after they're reading on their own than before, because that's the time when they're really needing all these really advanced and sophisticated language patterns. And also being able to read above their love, you know, there's always books that they can't read to themselves when they're fourth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade that you can read to them and discuss with them. So that's interesting. Yeah. And that's for sure. And even Jim Treelees has this picture in his book where he's like reading to his teenager while the teenager is doing the dishes. So I definitely think that's important. But then what that indicates is that parents are stopping. They're not reading to their kids when they're eight because they say, oh, my kid can read now. Why would I read to him? And so I think the thing happens within kids. You say, 
oh, Johnny's a good reader. I don't really need to read to him. Tommy's really struggling, so I should spend more time reading to him. So I think that's the conscious part of it. And there's actually a really funny book, a Grover book, where Grover learns to read, but he's super scared about letting his mom know that he can read because he's so afraid that she'll stop reading to him. Oh my gosh, I don't know what that book is. But... I'll, I'll give you a link. Okay. It's, it's, it's a wonderful <laughs> book. And finally, the secret kind of slips out and his mother discovers he can read and he's so, he's so scared. And his mom's like, don't worry, I'll keep reading to you. But I, I think like we have this mistaken notion of we read to our kids until they can read. And then we should let them read. And, and I think that like reading to yourself and being read to are both very important things. And I think our research is kind of speaking to the behavior that parents engage in. So one of the other things you said in your paper was that reading together is one of the most important parent-child activities in terms of time investment. And that can predict how well children do in reading, but it also predicts how well they do in math and other school subjects. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. I mean, so I think what reading does is it opens up the ability to think about problems. It gives you kind of this cognitive advantage that spills over to other topics. And so originally we were thinking, oh, this nice thing we can do is we can look at the effect of reading to your kids and it should only affect reading scores. It shouldn't affect math scores. And this will allow us to then to kind of separate the role of reading to your kids. But the more we thought about it, lots of kids trip up over word problems. They trip over kind of understanding the language of math. And I think the kids that are equipped with the ability to acquire vocabulary and just encounter new materials, it's going to allow them to do well at science, math, history, anything that involves any kind of, of words. That goes along with what Dr. Pakalik said on her episode, which I should probably pull up so I know which episode it is. I think it's episode seven, but we'll put a link in the show notes to it. But one of the things she said as a assistant professor of economics was that she really feels like with her own children, her goal, rather than being super focused on math and science, is going to be very focused on a liberal arts education or one that's very, oh, robust with literature because reading literature and reading books and engaging in stories helps you learn how to think well. And that she thinks that went a really long way. Her own liberal arts education went a really long way to preparing her to do well in math and science, which I don't think is, inst I don't think we just instinctually know that. I think we kind of need to be told that as parents. <laughs> Yeah, though, actually, now that the great thing is there's so many good books that directly speak about science and math. I just recently read Math Geek, which is a great book for kids. I'm excited to read Fermat's Enigma to my kids. The kids read Science Fair Season, The Sorcerer's Apprentices. These are all books that really, you know, speak directly to the kind of beauty of math and science. Yes. In ways that I think we often don't capture in a textbook. Have you seen Archimedes and the Door of Science or that whole series? I think it's by Jeannie Burdick, I think is the name of the author. I haven't, but I just wrote it down. Okay. So. Yeah, I keep hearing. I haven't read it myself. I ordered them, though, for us to read this year because I keep hearing from people I really trust. These books are amazing. So I love finding really beautifully written living books about math and science. The other one that my young kids really liked, probably my daughters both read it when they were maybe 11, 10 or 11, were... It's a series called Mathematicians or People Too. And they're just really engaging biographies about mathematicians. And my oldest daughter's a history fanatic. So she loves historical fiction and or I mean, biographies, anything that sits in history. And so she loved that book. And it, math is not her favorite subject. So that was kind of a way for me to slide into her favorite subject with a <laughs> one that she doesn't necessarily love right off the bat. So yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, the more that authors can find ways, I think of like, how clever Lemony Snicket is at introducing vocabulary to kids mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or how like Mary Pope Osborne has done such a great job at introducing his story to kids through her stories. I think the more that authors can find clever ways to teach their kids math and science concepts, it's, it's just going to open up some needs. And I even have, I like I've written a children's book that I share in schools about these pirates that have a, a math machine. And, and the punchline is that uh, it involves multiplying by zero where all the treasure disappears. But um, <laughs> I didn't know you had written a book. What's it called? Oh, no, it's, uh, it's, it's just, it's called the, I don't even have a title. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's written out and I tell it. Okay. To, uh, but the pirates create a multiplication machine and the other pirates put their treasure in it and it multiplies by two and then by three. And so they get excited and they put all their treasure in the machine and they come back the next day and it's all gone. And the machine says, we multiply by zero. And, and the kids catch the punchline and they, um, you know, I think it's, it's just a fun way to introduce 
the power of zero when you come to multiplication. Yes. My son was struggling with place value last year. And so we read, oh goodness, I've been, oh, circumference and all the king's tens. The circumference and the knights of the round. I lo- yeah, I lo- that's a great book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they've got the whole series. I need to get a few more of them because we were really kind of going head to head on math a lot of days. And so that was just a nice way to step outside of what we were normally doing and think about it in a new way. And he wanted me to read it to him several times. And I think it finally did make a few things click, you know, so that's very cool. Okay, crunching numbers a little bit. There were some results in your paper that were interesting to me. One of them indicated that adding an extra hour per week of parent-child reading over the course of a year it would produce the same change in test scores as an additional $32 in family income. Am I getting that right? Am I botching that? <laughs> uh, no, it's, we're not quite sure if that's the right number, but let me give you the thought process of how to think about how to quantify. Because a lot of it, I think parents are saying, well, how important is it for me to spend extra time with my kids? And, and here's like a, a real life dilemma. Imagine you're a father and you could either go work the extra hour of overtime or you could spend the time with your kids. What you really want to know is how much is that time spent reading to your kids or talking? How much will that change their life relative to just having a little bit of extra income as a family? And this kind of thought process actually occurred in grad school where I'd planned to spend the evening with the family. It was a Monday night. And right at the last minute, a student says, hey, I really want you to tutor me and I'll pay you $25 an hour. And so I call my wife and I say, Emily, do you want the $50 or do you want the two hours? And she says, I, I really want the two hours. I know. I was going to say, I know what I would say in that response. <laughs> and he gets desperate and he says, I'll pay you $50 an hour. Mm. And so I call Emily back and I say, Emily, do you want the two hours or do you want the $100? And she says, I'll take the $100. <laughs> okay. Yep. So it got me thinking about, well, what was the number at which she should be indifferent between the money and the time? And, and I think that's what we're trying to get at there in that paper. I don't know if we have the right number. You know, some of the estimates indicate that it might be about $32 an hour. But I think it's going to differ a lot about how much time you're already spending with the kids and kind of how you're using that time. But now I've realized that actually that's the wrong thought process. I think when it comes to reading more to our kids, the trade-off is not between like working and reading. It's really about reading versus watching TV because we spend so much time watching TV with our kids that even if we took like like a little frack, like collectively as a country, if we took like 10% of our TV time and reallocated it to reading we triple the amount of time we were, we were reading to our kids. That's um, a good point. I love telling people that if we read to our kids five minutes a day, every day for a year, that's over 30 hours at the end of the year. Because I think it doesn't feel like when you're thinking in a 24 hour chunk, it just kind of feels like it's not going to make that big of a difference. But it, there's almost no excuse to not carve out the time to spend with our kids, even though I know, I mean, we're all so busy and there's so many pressures and I certainly don't mean to add to the guilt or you know, weight of those burdens for parents. But I also know as a parent of a lot of kids, it's really easy for me to say, I've got so much to do. So I'm not really sure if spending 10 minutes reading to my kids today is going to fit in. But it helps me to know that, first of all, 10 minutes is all it takes. And that's 60 hours of reading aloud over the course of a year. That's a pretty tremendous investment in my children. Definitely. And I think that's the right approach is like start small and then build up. And, you know, families of faith, you know, hopefully they're finding time to read scriptures as a family or whatever religious writing they have. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, if you get good at picking the right books, your kids will beg you every night to read it to them. I love that pressure because it really helps me actually sit down and read to them. We just finished a Brandon Mole book. It's the Five Kingdom series. It's the first one, Sky Raiders. And the kids beg me every night to read to them. And then finally, when we had about, I don't know, 90 pages left in the book, they just wouldn't let me stop. It was a Sunday afternoon and we read the whole, we just finished the whole book. And it was, (laughs) it was really a great book, but I think that's one of the tricks is when you find those great books, your kids will help make it easy for you to remember every night. Yes. And if you're enjoying it yourself, because I've read a few books to my kids where I'm not really enjoying it myself. And the difference between one of those and something that I'm just delighting in myself, it's so much easier to read to your kids when you're having a good time yourself, (laughs) when it's a good book for you too. And the other nice thing there is then trying to make it enjoyable for both of you is you can actually take a book that might not be age appropriate and through your own editing in the process, make it So for example, Jurassic Park is probably not a book I would have my kids read just because of the language and other things. But it's one that, you know, by through my own kind of clear play editing as I read to them, it was actually a a really fun thing for both of us. And, you know, I feel the same way about a lot of Orson Scott Card's books or other books that are just, you know, really great books, Mm -hmm. but just need a little bit of content editing based on kind of your own family standards. Yes. My husband read Hatchet. I don't know if you're familiar with that book. It's about a boy. Great great book. Yeah. Yeah. 
So he read it to the kids when they were, oh gosh, I think my oldest might have been 10. And so they were 10, 8, and 6 would be the oldest kids' ages at that time. And it was a great book, but there was just one like kind of parallel plot thing about what happened to the uh, main character's parents that we didn't think was necessary to the story or really that helpful for that age group. I mean, terribly appropriate for the age that he was reading to. So it's so much easier if you're reading aloud to be able to just kind of like you said, do a little content editing as you're reading it aloud rather than just handing Sometimes the book there's, a, there's a bit of a pause and the kids will just be like, yeah, what's going on? I'm just, oh, don't worry, I'll, I'll get to the story really quick. Yeah. <laughs> so, you're kind of skipping ahead. And, but you're right, there's often just little plot elements that probably aren't supposed to be there. Actually, I mean, we just read a great book. It was called Chess Master by Klaus. Hmm. And my kids love chess. This was a book about chess. Actually, such a great book. But again, needed a few kind of uh, mature themed stuff to come out of it. Yeah. But a g- great book. Yeah. That's a great way to be able to read some books that you think, oh, it was so close to being able to make the cut. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'm curious to know, so you've named a few other books. So what What other, I guess, actually, let's take this back a step. What sorts of books did you read growing up? Well, okay, I am embarrassed. I I wasted a lot of time on the Hardy Boys. Uh, <laughs> so I read probably every Hardy Boy book there was. Yep. But, you know, I can't remember any of them because they're so similar to each other. Yeah, they all have the same plot line. <laughs> uh, one thing I did do is I tried to read all the Newbery books, and I really enjoyed those. And then as I got you know, into my teenage years, I, I fell in love with James Mishner. I fell in love with John Grisham and Tom Clancy. Those were Michael Crichton. Those were kind of what my standard fare as a teenager. I, I try to maybe give my kids a little more uh, broad exposure to books, but I, I definitely had my favorite authors and I just read everything. I would go to the bookstore whenever a Grisham book came out and just read the whole book. Yeah, that's pretty much what I did with my favorite authors too. And most of them, I mean, I was, you know, during elementary school, I think I read every Babysitter's Club book there was in the series. And my own kids, I think, would probably roll their eyes at those books, which makes me kind of happy. But, you know, it turned, they turned me into a reader. So that's okay. <laughs> well, I mean, Harry Potter was a game changer. I mean, the books today are so much better. Yep. And I, I mean, I had actually been out of the country for two years. And when I came back, I saw some college student with this book. And it was a children's book. I was a little puzzled. And she was surprised I'd never heard of this uh, Harry Potter series. But I, I quickly fell in love. And, you know, it was really neat to actually be at the park the day the book came out and see like 30 of us parents all reading the same book at the same time. Yeah, that's fun. <laughs> That's the series that turned my son, who was a bit of a struggling reader there for a while, into a voracious reader. So, yeah. (laughs) Do you have any other math or, I don't know, science or economics themed books besides the ones you already mentioned that you would recommend? Yeah, I don't know any kind of, I'm trying to think. I, I can't pull them off hand. Uh, I mean, there's definitely been a lot of books that I've read that I'm kind of excited to introduce to my kids, mm-hmm. you know, like economics or the science of Harry Potter, or I'm reading one right now called The Eureka Factor. It's aha moments, creative insight in the brain. I really enjoyed The Innovators by Walter Isaacson. Hmm. Okay. Um, and uh, I don't, yeah, I, I read about 20 books a month. And Oh, wow. Try, that's amazing. I try to just mark those that, you know, I hope my kids will read as they get older. And yeah, I just... But that's the case where I think like always looking for where our kids are at in terms of their ability and like how much more it would take for them to be able to read that next level of books that might just open up their horizons to totally new topics. Okay. So that's going to lead me to another question. So you said you read about 20 books a month and obviously you're a working father of seven kids. So tell me when you read. So a lot of that reading happens, like I just, I had a a meeting in DC. So kind of flying there and back, I, I probably read about four books on the trip. I do read fast. I've had some debates with some of my kids' teachers about the merits of speed reading. But I definitely, I think the ability to read fast is helpful because then when you see a book and you're debating whether you should read it, I basically have to ask, okay, is this worth, you know, two hours of my time as opposed to asking, is this worth, you know, six hours of my time? And so I think that kind of expands the kind of types of books that I choose to read. That's a really good point. So where did you learn how to speed read? BYU had a class on speed reading and I took a few of the classes and then it just kind of came with practice. I think the real key is just if you get in the habit of timing yourself while you read, it really helps you kind of identify things that help you read faster and the things that slow you down. Interesting. Okay. I saw a tip and I don't know if this is worthwhile or not, but I saw a tip online the other day that had said, you know, let's see if I can describe it. 
if you have the whole length of a line, the whole width, let's say, of a line that you're reading, you really only need to read like the middle, I don't know what the he said, 65 or 70 percent of it. And the one like your peripheral vision will catch the words on the end. Is that anything valid or is that completely crazy? Do you know? Oh, no, no, that's certainly right. And then actually what will start to happen is then you'll start to look at, at words in even bigger blocks. So not just like a single line, but you'll start to look at like a big chunk. And, and your brain has an amazing capacity to pull all that information in and, and really. And actually, one thing I find is that when I speed read it, it, it requires so much of my focus and attention that I actually end up getting a lot more out of the experience. Interesting. Uh, because I think a lot of us, when we read, our brain kind of goes into wander mode at times. And so anything that can keep you from going into wander mode, I think will give you this really focused experience. Yeah, especially if I've been online a lot right before I sit down to read. It's almost like my brain doesn't remember how to just read a regular page. It's, it's kind of frightening, actually. Do you teach your kids how to speed read then? You know, I've debated this. I do worry because one of my kids is actually, he's historically been much slower reader. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's gotten faster more recently, so hopefully. But he's he's the son that I had the debate with the teacher about. I said, you know, if you read so slow, isn't this an issue? And she's she felt like how fast you read isn't that big of an issue. But I just felt like if you can read faster, then you get to read more. So yeah, I, I haven't really like actively taught them to speed read. But maybe after this conversation, I might think about it a little more. <laughs> well, I'm really interested in that. That's I mean, just listening to you say, you know, I have to think about, do I have two hours to read this or six hours to read this? Yeah, I can see the benefits of that for sure. So you've got seven kids, 14 down to one, I think you said, right? That's right. Um, when does your family find is the best time for reading a le- reading together? So we, uh, we read the scriptures every morning. So that's about 15 minutes. And then for us, the best is just right before they go to bed. Yeah. So usually they're going to bed, you know, around nine, nine thirty. So just a half an hour before that, we try to gather them together. And, and right now I, I am working with the older kids. My wife reads the younger kids, though the younger kids always want me to tell them stories. So that happens, kind of gets interspersed across the different days as well. So you can separate them into two groups. We probably, well, I guess we do that kind of naturally too, because our six kids, the three oldest are pretty close together in age. And then the three youngest are pretty close together in age. There's this big gap between them. So I guess we kind of naturally do that, but I could see as they get older, just doing that a little more intentionally where one of us reads to this group and the other one reads to that group and then everybody's in bed. Hallelujah. <laughs> because, because otherwise you have to always have very fast paced books. Yeah. And for right now, for example, right now we're reading Navigating Early by Claire Vanderpool. She's the one that wrote Moon Over Manifest. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's, I loved Moon Over Manifest. Navigating Early has been really great so far, but it's, it hasn't been like as fast paced as an Alex Ryder book. And so the ability to have kids that are a little more patient, I think, opens up the kind of books that you can read to them. Yeah, that's so true. I've noticed that too, that when people will write in and say, it, my kids just won't sit and listen to something. Well, but besides the fact that my suggestion would be to give them something to do with their hands. My other suggestion is just that they will actually be able to listen to longer narrative the more that they're read aloud to. So, you know, don't start with something long and descriptive. Start with something kind of short and punchy and then work your way up. Would you say something like that too? Oh, that's certainly right. I mean, I think this is why, like, if you're a parent that's just starting out and you've got kids in the, you know, eight to 10 range, I think actually Lewis Sacker is a really great writer to start with, especially the Wayside School, because the chapters are pretty short, they're self-contained, and they really move fast. Same thing with Magic Treehouse. I mean, those Magic Treehouse books really, really move, the plot moves along really quickly. Mm -hmm. But I think as your kids start to, you know, become better at listening, then you can start to... uh, attack harder things. I think the hardest one we've ever done is with the kids was uh, Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time. It's a great book, but those books are, they take a long time to read. Yeah. Uh, He's got a lot of detail, but I think the ability to like introduce your kids to those kind of books can really open up some neat opportunities for them. Now, I'm not going to read the rest of the Robert Jordan series out loud to them, but definitely reading the first book then creates an incentive for them to want to read some of the others. I love that strategy. I use that one myself too. I don't really have the desire to read an entire series. Usually, even if I just enjoy the series, I don't know that I want to read them all aloud because then I feel like, well, that's what we're going to read this year and nothing else. But if you read the first one in this series, I've found so many times Mary Poppins or goodness, there was another one we just read that I completely just slipped my mind. Anyway, um, my kids were really interested in then taking, you know, going off and or the Lord of the Rings or something where you can read the first one and then they want, they can't help but want to find out what comes next. So... Yeah, I think that's that's actually a great stretch. So we did this right now with Brandon Moles, the Five Kingdoms series. Mm-hmm. I read the first one. They wanted me to start the second one right away. And I just said, no, if you guys want the second one, you're going to have to read it yourself. And so <laughs> right away, now my second son is trying to cruise through the book he's on right now so he can get to um, that second book. Of oh, that's great. <laughs> that's fun. 
Well, gosh, Dr. Price, thank you so much for your time. I'm glad we finally got were able to connect because this has been a very delightful conversation. So I appreciate it. Thanks, Sarah. Now it's time for Let the Kids Speak. This is my favorite part of the podcast, where kids tell us about their favorite stories that have been read aloud to them. Hi, my name is Celia, and I'm eight years old, and I'm from Florida, and I've been reading The Little House books by Laura Ingalls Wilder, and she was a real person, and she wrote about her life as a little girl, and the books are really good, and as you read the whole entire series, they get better and better and better and better and better, and then it's the best book ever because... You know, you read them and they're really good. Hi, my name is Josiah and I am eight years old. I live in Kenya and I would like to share a favorite book that has been read aloud to me by my dad. It is called The BFG by Roald Dahl. The book is about a girl who is kidnapped by a giant and she thinks the giant will eat her. But he doesn't because he is the BFG, which stands for the Big Friendly Giant. I like the book because it is funny and has good humor. Thank you for having me. My name is Jabali. Your name is Jabali. And what's yeah. your favorite books that mommy and daddy read to you? You like a and a mother for Chaco. Good night, Gorilla, and a mother for Chaco. Yeah. How old are you? Four and a half. You're almost four. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Say bye bye. Bye. Hi, my name is Benny. I am five. And where do you live? In Kenya. And what is your favorite book? The Sneetches. And why do you like it? Because it's funny. My name is Philip Xavier Van Campen. I'm five. And what is the name of your town? Rocky Mountain House, Alberta, in Canada. And what's the name of your favorite book? Thunder Cake by Patricia Palaco. And why do you like the book? Because it has cake in it. My name is Lucia Rose Van Campen, and I live in Rocky Mountain House, Alberta. And my favorite read aloud book is The Chronicles of Narnia. My favorite character in that book is Lucy because my name is Lucia and she has almost the same name as me. And I'm six years old. Good stuff. (laughs) Thanks, kids. I appreciate you calling in. Hey, if you want to know the best ways to simplify your homeschool and focus on what matters most regarding your time with your kids, head to readaloudrevival.com and look for episode 33 to grab a free PDF that gives you the best tips from today's leading homeschooling experts and leaders. It's free. Thousands of parents have already grabbed it for themselves and they're telling me constantly how much they love it. So I think you will love it too. Again, that's at readaloudrevival.com. Just look for episode 33. That's it today. A little bit shorter show than normal, but hopefully it didn't pack any less of a punch. I can't wait to talk with you again in a couple of weeks. But until then, go build your family culture around books. Mm -hmm.